to some extent it was also the result of uh, weak ec global export demand, uh, which we expect to change. But the main thing is that um, even though the current account is now in a deficit, the, the inflows on the, on the, in the financial and capital accounts are, are strong enough and, and um, diverse enough that Indonesia is more than uh, uh, able to finance the current account deficits. Um, which means that the, um, the reserve cushion which Indonesia has built up steadily over the last decade remains very solid at, at over a hundred billion um, dollars at the end of February, which is sufficient to, um, to cover uh, close to six months of export, uh, six months of import and debt service commitments. The ratio that we, um, we use is gross external financing needs as a share of current account receipts and usable reserves. Mm -hmm. And that ratio is at around 90%, which as you will see in the, in the next chart is again comparable with, with peers. So we view external the external liquidity positions, we still view that as a credit supporting factor. Now our, our expectation is that um, as I mentioned, um, part of the reason for the current account uh, turning into a deficit was the weak export demand. Now, as, as the global economy um, recovers, we expect that to, um, um, to, to, to turn around somewhat. And we believe that the current account will stay in a deficit, but in a, in a very <coughs> modest position. And, and that deficit will be comfortably covered by foreign direct investment and portfolio inflows, which both of which we expect to remain um, robust in the, uh, in, the, in the medium term. This is the external liquidity ratio that, um, that I mentioned, um, which shows that, again, Indonesia is in is, is comfortable position and compares well to most of its, uh, its rating peers. And um, um, as, as I mentioned, foreign direct investment, which took a long time to recover uh, following the Asian financial crisis and it's still well below its potential. We see that um, has, has, has recovered strongly, especially last year, and we expect that to continue um, given the Indonesia's um, growth potential and uh, macroeconomic stability. Let me now um, turn to the credit fundamentals which we in our methodology consider as the key rating constraints for the sovereign rating of Indonesia. Um, one of these is the low per capita GDP. Um, for 2012 it's close to $4,000. Um, um, in our methodology per capita GDP is a proxy or an approximation for the government's uh, uh, political and policy flexibility. It's also uh, an approximation of the revenue base which a government has available. Higher income countries tend to have a much higher as well as broader based um, revenue source than lower income countries. And higher income countries tend to have more political flexibility, flexibility to um, implement um, belt tightening measures should the need arise for such measures um, in order to avoid default. So, um, I know some people will bring up the examples of, of Greece and some other Western European countries which found themselves in dire straits and where political and policy flexibility does not seem to be in abundance um, despite their much higher per capita GDP levels. Nevertheless, the, the per capita wealth level we find that over, over a very long period of time and, and in, in a global perspective is a very good approximation of both political and policy flexibility. Hence the reason that we consider that <coughs> as a key rating factor. So for Indonesia that's, that's, that's still a low, still a low approximately $4,000. It's, it's rising fast but it's rising from a, from a low base and we believe it will take another um, year or two for that to um, grow into the next uh, next bucket or next bracket I should say which 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 will then uh, provide an impetus for for a higher rating 
The other uh, significant rating constraint is the high external leverage. So previously I, I talked about high, the external liquidity being um, a rating strength. External leverage, however, is still very high, um, in particular uh, external leverage of the private sector. Um, dom the domestic corporate bond market is, is very undeveloped in Indonesia and um, most companies will either borrow uh, from, from the banking sector or will borrow um, externally. And as, uh, as it was mentioned in, in the previous presentation, some quite a number of Indonesian corporates have defaulted on external debt and there is at least one or two which, which are still not servicing the external debt on which um, they defaulted. So the, the measure that we use for external, external leverage is net external liabilities as a percentage of current account receipts. Now that, that of course includes the external liability of the country as a whole. That means the government, uh, the non-bank private sector and the corporate private sector. So I mentioned that the external um, debt of the, um, of the government has fallen sig significantly but it's much less the case for the corporate sector. So for the country as a whole, external liability is still high um, at 133% of current account receipts. And um, well, on this graph you see that what I um, said earlier, that external debt um, has declined considerably, and, but it still remains high compared to all, all the peer countries. Um, And this high external debt or external leverage um, against Indonesia's volatile and confidence sensitive currency, we still view that as a, as a risk factor and um, as, 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 as I'm sure you, you're familiar very often what tends to happen um, for development in, for reasons that, that have nothing to do with Indonesia market development in other parts of the world, in other emerging markets. Um, portfolio withdrawals sometimes um, occur and uh, the hot money suddenly leaves Indonesia leaving the central bank uh, scrambling to support the exchange rate and the, this happens time and again whenever there is volatility in the global financial markets and Indonesia often through no fault of its own is, is, is a victim of that and um, um, essentially its currency, its volatile currency against the high um, external liability is, is for us uh, um, an enduring rating constraint. And then um, let me now turn to the, the, um, the qualitative aspects of the, of, of the underlying credit fundamentals. Pre before, previously we talked about um, uh, external, external, external debt, and um, um, the the um, high level of corporate leverage. Um, so these are mostly ratio driven, but there's also a qualitative weakness to the Indonesian credit story, and this essentially speaks to the weak institutions, weak governance. Um, structural shortcomings and the lack of infrastructure. We look at a number of indicators in, in, in this area such as the Transparency International Corru International's Corruption Perception Index, World Bank Governance Indicators and um, despite some improvements in, in recent years, uh, Indonesia is still ranked very low on, on, on all of these uh, international indicators. And then when we speak to private sector or uh, uh, multilateral agencies in, in Indonesia, um, these low, low rankings are, are confirmed in so many, um, so many ways. And it's part of the reason why Indonesia's growth potential or, or, or growth and its um, potential to attract foreign direct investment is still below, um, below potential. So, the weak institutions um, 
and, and the structural shortcomings are a qualitative rating constraint which we um, account for in our um, political score which underlies the rating. And then um, there is also, of course, the uncertainty that, that the country faces following um, next year's election. Um, after two, um, two terms by, by um, the President Giuliano, in which we've seen considerable progress in, uh, in, in uh, some microeconomic reforms in the fight against corruption, and where the macroeconomy was, 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 was stable and growth was strong, we simply don't know at this stage who and what will follow the Udiono government. Um, the field of potential presidential candidates is still wide open. It's very difficult to speculate who uh, may become, become the next president, but um, when you look at the current crop of candidates, um, um, I think there are, there, there are some reservations um, there uh, with respect to each. And fundamentally, it, given the Indonesian presidential system and, and how strong the, the president's office in Indonesia is, it, it, it will ultimately come down to the, the personal inclinations and capacity of the next president, as, as well as his or her ability to um, maintain support in the legislature and, and among the population. Um, so we just don't know what kind of uh, um, um, political and policy environment will follow the two terms of Udiono, which one could describe as, as two successful terms. Um, then there is, of course, the, as, as Xavier mentioned in his presentation, we've seen uh, increasing um, uh, number of populist and nationally driven policies. Um, many of which have been sort of delivered in an ad hoc way, not properly thought through. And as the elections draw nearer, and even during the next government, if, if we get a populist uh, president, then there is that risk that uh, um, um, economic policy, uh, policy making will, will, will be det det detrimental to the country's growth prospects. Um, having said that, um, our base case scenario with respect to the uh, political and, and policy environment under a new administration is that um, we believe that the, the fundament that there aren't going to be um, <coughs> fundamental changes. We believe that one of the key uh, underlying rating strengths of Indonesia, the conservative fiscal stance, we believe that that will certainly remain. That has never changed under uh, successive administrations, and there have never been any voices or strong um, strong push from any quarters to, to change that um, basic fiscal orientation of, of, of low deficits. And we also believe that broadly market-oriented policies um, will remain, but with the with the odd uh, nationalistic or, or protectionist um, type of measures uh, that may come along. But we, we also, our basic scenario is that, that at the end of the day, pragmatism will prevail and, and that will temper any um, nationalist impulses in policy making. I think f the, the next rating uh, move or a rating upgrade will largely depend on um, further reform measures. And um, I mean, at the risk of you know sounding the, sounding like I'm obfuscating or, or, or trying to be vague, um, it's not it's never a X Y Z uh, event uh, occurring that will move the rating. It's always a combination of factors, but essentially we're looking for uh, microeconomic reforms. Uh, the macroeconomy is now stable. We're looking for improved um, improved governance. Improvement in the business environment, uh, improvements that will reinforce the positive fiscal trend, um, and I suppose that speaks to uh, rationalizing the subsidy regime, and uh, microeconomic reforms that will support further foreign direct investment. 
So all in all, we, I suppose we're looking for reforms that will uh, raise Indonesia's medium-term growth, growth prospects, reinforce its positive debt dynamics, and or will mitigate the, the still remaining risk factors such as it, um, volatile exchange rate and um, um, high external leverage. Um, conversely, if, if we don't see these um, policies forthcoming or if then uh, the rating is likely to stabilize at the current level and that would happen if, if, if there is a marked um, departure um, uh, from fiscal prudence. If, so, if the subsidy issue is not addressed satisfactorily or if um, policies again mm, deteriorate the quality of expenditure or, or suppress uh, foreign direct investment.